Okay. So anyway, um, yeah, I'm gonna. By the way, guys, um, it's the first time I'm doing this. I haven't done a presentation in over 20 years, so I did it professionally. But I kind of wing this. I'm not sure exactly what you guys are interested in. So what I will ask you to do is if you pose your questions to the end, okay, if you could. Also, I had a handout you know, at the end. And the handout is a, a, a historian contacted me about uh, three. Oh, sure. Okay. And I'm sorry. And anyway, and um, I vet at the historian, so I put a, together a quite extensive package, like six pages of history on it. And then it talks about my experience there in and, Nam, and, uh, uh, what I, uh, the equipment I had, and also uh, some of my uh, <coughs> firefights that I had there. So I'll pass that out later. We can look it over. If you have any questions, uh, we, can, uh, we can try to answer that. But uh, I was in Vietnam in 1969. I was drafted in December of 68, and I got out in December of 1970. And uh, for those of you who don't know what my real title was, was a love and bravo. And that's a grunt. And those of you who don't know what a grunt is, a grunt is an infantry soldier. Toughest job in the world. Uh, I was in Delta Capity, 2nd Battalion, 8th Cavalry, 1st Air Cap. And for some of you pioneers out there, uh, this is where we're pioneering the helicopter um, as a vehicle to move troops into different sections. So I flew around in helicopters a lot. Not to, It was nice, but dangerous. Um, I was a PFC E3, I came out of Spec 4, and some of the awards I've got, of course you can see National Defense, Vietnam Service Medal, Campaign Medal, I was a good guy, good contact, <laughs> Combat Infantry Badge, Purple Heart and Bronze Star will be device, I saved the guy's life one day, and they gave me a medal for it. Uh, also up here it says Angry Skipper, and that's the website of my company, I found this out about uh, three or four years ago, we actually had a website. And um, the folks in the, that run this uh, website and everything has an annual reunions. I have never attended any, but um, uh, you want to go look at it? I went there last night. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, OK. Uh, one of the things that was unfortunate in Vietnam, like we have today, is no one had cameras. You couldn't take very many pictures. There are some guys that have cameras and have pictures, but we don't have a lot of historical records like today, you know, in real time, you could be out there taking pictures of what's going on and, and uh, whatever's going on at the time. Want to go to the next slide, Stu? Yeah. Okay. As I said, we're 11 Bravo, and what it was is that we were a company of about 100 guys, and we were on the Vietnamese-Cambodian border long before Nixon ever said we were there. Um, we did search and destroy missions. And we conducted night ambushes. We would do a D-type ambush, and that's where one, one platoon would be on what they call the kill. And then the other two uh, platoons would be around the, in a, in a D-type circle, protect them to kill zone. We'd set up some trip flares on each side. We had those wonderful Claymore mines, and depending on, you know, what flare went off, if you were on the kill, you are sitting there with two detonators in your hands, and you would <coughs> click one or the other. <clears throat> I was a point guy, four or five guys, and apparently, you know, I got selected to be a point guy because I put the smartest guys out in front. <laughs> 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 now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, you know? I thought it was the handsomest one. Yeah, well, <laughs> but anyway, they so said they want the smartest guys out there, and after a while I learned we probably didn't want the smartest guys out there because we had some really dumb guys. Um, <laughs> you know, they didn't... Um, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. You know, you get through the training. I went through six and a half months of intensive training. I went through more training in Vietnam before I actually got out there. And um, it, you're trained to stay alive. And you're, you're living out there in these conditions. And you don't drop on that training and, and do what the disciplines you have to do. Like, uh, you had to make sure your weapon was cleaned every day. And you had to make sure that your magazines had clean ammunition and stuff. And there was many, many things that went on. A lot of guys got lazy, didn't do that stuff, and then they pay the price later on because obviously it might be in a firefight and all of a sudden the weapon doesn't work or their magazines break and they can't, uh, they can't use them, gun jams up, they have bigger problems. That was an important thing. 
I saw considerable action for the short time I was there. I was there in May and I got airlifted to Japan at the end of August. Um, sometimes I was in three firefights a day. That's a lot of fighting. <laughs> and, uh, that is. Mm, that's a lot. The, uh, I come up with <laughs> two little things called solo group kills. I got three solo kills. I got 11 group. And the group kills was when we're on the kill zone, uh, we're sitting there with the detonators. The whole team got credit for whatever we got. Sometimes we get nine, ten guys at a night. And then I'll get to the next slide later, but what the hard parts of what the job was. But uh, a lot of people ask me to ever kill anybody. Yes, I have. Next slide, please, Steve. Living in a jungle is awful, okay, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a nice word. I could use some other four-letter phrase to describe this, but you know, I was trying to be nice. You got the bugs. You got the rain. You got const you're constantly wet. You got the heat. You get jungle rot. You're never dry. And uh, I kind I got the jungle rot, but it took about two years to uh, for it to finally leave me. That's where your skin just rot rots off your body. Oh, gee. Um, you're never clean. You yeah. might be able to get to brush your teeth. Your tail is your best buddy, because that's just wiping the sweat off your body constantly. It's, it's just, uh, you don't want to get the elements. And besides that, you got people out there trying to kill you. Wow. Um, loneliness, fatigue, never enough to eat, and being dirty. Um, we didn't have, like today, the troops have that real-time smartphone in their hand to be able to communicate back and stuff. You've got letters, generally, once every five to ten days. You should get a stack in them from home. But I mean, that's your, that was your vehicle for communication, okay? We didn't have any news. We, didn't, we really didn't know what was going on. We never really got any updates. We're pretty isolated. We're on the border. We would be out in the field for three to four weeks. Every five days, if we were lucky, we got resupplied. Then for a, about anywhere from five to six days, we'd be on the fire base pulling duty. So we had a battalion fire base. There was um, five companies, and then we would rotate off. Um, when you're on the fire base, obviously, you're doing maintenance, you're building bunkers, you're doing whatever you have to do. One of the things we did at night was we had mad minutes. And that's why you had to shoot up your old ammunition. And because uh, you want to have fresh ammunition. So, you know, say around 11 o'clock, and whoever was in charge of Sarge said, okay, bad minute, let's go. And who, if you're pulling guard duty at the time, you run through maybe four or five magazines through your M16. Hmm. Now, a lot of people think that's a waste of ammunition, but it's not. It's really important to do that, to put fresh ammunition. And it was a lot of fun going full automatic with an M16 and just sitting on the wood line. So that was our fun, I guess. Hmm. Loneliness, believe me. Uh, uh, I miss my family terribly. We're always tired. I, most I ever got, most I ever got at night was about six hours of sleep. Mm. If I was lucky, if we had an ambush, like when we pulled one night, we got eleven gooks on that one, and they came into our position, so we couldn't sleep. <coughs> they came to our position. We used two defensive claymores to kill a couple more of them, and there was the four, the four of us standing in three feet of water in our foxhole all night. I was up for about 47 straight hours, believe me, I was tired. Mm. Uh, never had enough to eat, we only had two meals a day. Mm. Uh, we had sea rations, they were from the Korea era, era. and we had these new things called freeze-dried food. Freeze-dried food, was the, we called them LERPs, Long Range Patrol. And you mix it with hot water, and you, um, and you mix it up in this bag, and usually rice and chicken was the best for peas. That's what we ate. Of course, we're always being dirty. One of the things is that um, when we ate, okay, especially in the morning, I used to like to have a tin of uh, pork and beans. That was the best thing out of the sea rations. And you made yourself a little stove, and uh, you would heat this food up. Now, we didn't have any uh, heating tablets. We used C4. I carried two pounds of C4, and you shape it into a little tablet. You put it into this little stove you made, and you light it. Number one rule, never step on a C4, okay? But this would just flare up, and in about a minute, you got some hot pork and beans. Uh, one of the awful things was, too, it's called cleaning up the battlefield. 
Okay, after you just pulverized a human being, you got to dispose of it. You have to clean up the battlefield. We generally would um, try to find, we were in an area where it was bombed out, like uh, with Bob over here who bombed the hell out of Vietnam his prior, his buddies after him. You know, we find a 2,000 pound bomb crater and you would throw the bodies down in there. Generally there was a lot of rain, so there was a lot of water in there and uh, you just roll the bodies down in there and then we gave them some kind of burial. Um, having not enough to eat or drink, and I'll get into it a little bit later, but um, we wouldn't get resupplied. I carried 15 quarts of water with me. If I was out of water and couldn't co collect any rainwater, and I didn't have any water. But sometimes we would have to go into these bomb craters and we would fill our canteens with the muddy water and uh, use that to eat and drink. So uh, one of the things you could say real quickly was, boy, did you get dysentery? Yeah, we had dysentery. Awful. Mm. Awful. Mm. Let's do the next slide. Okay. <coughs> Some of the things we did up into the jungle. I carried about 100 pounds on my back when I was fully loaded. Mm. But you can imagine, we didn't walk on trails. We didn't. We helped, we helped through the jungle. You know, hacking stuff through the jungle, uh, walking on trails was a, uh, you know, a no-no because the enemy would set up uh, <clears throat> uh, set up boot traps. They would set up ambushes just like we would, so you stayed off of them. So it was a little tough humping all that equipment through the jungle. Like I said, I uh, carried ten meals, five sea rations, and five lurks. Fifteen quarts of water. That's about twenty-six pounds. Mm, wow. I carried over 400 rounds of M16 and 100 rounds for the M16 machine gun. One of the things we always had to do was have a lot of ammo. Believe me, you could burn through it. I was um, on point so I could shoot full automatic all the time. And believe me, I would. And I could burn up ammo. My, uh, I got a nickname. Uh, you know, everybody had like nicknames or just their first name. That was Joe. And later on, based upon my experience in firefights, they named me Magazine Happy Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Carried two standard grenades and two baseball grenades. And I'll, if anybody doesn't know what that is, um, it's standard, uh, it's well. you know, put a, <clears throat> a handle on, that's a standard it's grenade, well, and it's a three to five second delayed fuse. You throw that thing and duck and it goes off. The baseball grenade is, is actually a baseball. And it arms within 10 feet, and you throw it, and if I threw it up against the wall here, it would explode. So it depended on what the mood was and what, what kind of ammo you needed to do whatever situation it was. Mm. Carried one Claymore mine. Four smoke canisters, which were vital because we were air mobile. We always had to mark spots for the helicopters to come in. And one flare, which was my our, our guardian angel for guarding uh, us at night, but also on the, on the trails to set uh, ambushes at night. Two ponchos and one poncho liner and one air mattress. Lots of bug repellent. Water bladders. We had these uh, five quart water bladders, and it, you know, so instead of carrying a hard type canteen, we had these water bladders, which was nice. And by the way, if you had just, a, I used to have an extra. I carried two. One was I blew up at night and it was a pillow to sleep on. So you, you don't have these little tricks to uh, have some level of comfort. Did not blow up the air mattress. It was just to lay down, so you just didn't have all the uh, dirt and grime there. Some of the level of cleanliness to lay down on. Because if you blew it up at night, you um, you make noise, no noise. When we walked through the jungle, you whispered. You would never talk like I'm talking right now. Everybody whispered. We had to go through it just to make sure that no one heard us. One of the bad problems we had that the gooks liked was we smoked. I chain smoked. And mainly because uh, I kept the bugs off of me. I just would rip them through my teeth and the smoke would keep the bugs off of me. But uh, we would, uh, again, done with your, your cigarette butt, we just throw it like that. We left a bad trail of that. Um, you know, bug repellent, water bladders, of course, bandages, cigarettes, writing paper, a toothbrush. I used to brush my teeth. And also had an extra one to clean my weapon. Had an entrenching tool. That was one of the big things. Because every night, we'd have to uh, 
dig a foxhole six feet by uh, three feet by four feet deep because all the whole team had to be able to get down in that foxhole in case if we got a mortar attack or whatever we needed for protection. So it was a lot of work. Um, and <clears throat> of course, you know, gas, we had a gas mask too and a helmet. Hmm. And, uh, and I also carry 172 millimeter anti-tank rocket because wow. the gooks, <laughs> when we were where we were going, they um, they started to use tanks, so we had carried uh, that too. So when you start adding this up, it, uh, wow. it's quite a lot of stuff. Is this the last slide or is there another one? That's the last That's one. That's it, okay. So um, uh, I'm trying to think if there's what I could add here to this. Um, let me see, I got a note here in my, my notes. I have a question, Joe. Um, yeah, yeah this uh, is, just a second. Yeah, sure. Uh, I made, a, I made a note on here. I just wanted to read this. this oh, yeah. I mentioned about the whispering. Um, we're grunts. Worst job in the world. We cursed a lot. Every, about every third word out of your mouth was a curse word. So whatever you needed, an adjective, adverb, object of the proposition. Okay, you guys got pretty much idea, ladies too, of phraseology. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. still you have a question. No, I, I knew somebody who served years ago, I talked to him, and he said that, um, obviously he wasn't going through the jungle with it, but he said if you were on a bunk, a bed, you had to put the legs of the bed in coffee cans filled with something to keep the bunks from climbing up on the... Is that... Well, I, I never had the luxury of yeah, being in a bed. Yeah. I don't know. Back in, the, the back in the rear somewhere. Yeah, because yeah, right, yeah. even around the fire base, we were sleeping on the ground. Yeah, right. So, yeah, you're in a bunker, but, but you're still... a lot of bugs crawling around. Bugs? Oh. Stuff. <laughs> you were saying about the language. Yeah. I had come up in a strict household and whenever use language, but I learned a lot of it, see, in basic training and stuff. So I come home for Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Pass the effing butter. Yeah. <laughs> Pass the effing butter. Oh, God. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, it, it, you know, and I, you know, once I got out, you know, and my mom used to yell at me, she said, what do you, I thought, it's going to take a while for yeah. me to get through wow. this, you know, because we just, even when I was stateside, I says, we cursed a lot. I mean, absolutely cursed. Yeah. You know? Know. Sir. So you said you were in uh, the border of Cambodia and Vietnam. Vietnam. <coughs> you, you said it was before Nixon? Before Nixon acknowledged we were there. So when, what year was that? 1969. 69. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. 69. Yeah. Sir. <coughs> Two questions. You said every now and then you'd burn up old bad ammo or something? Yes, sir. How, how bad and old and how fast did it get bad and old? I mean, isn't I, it? I changed it out every four weeks when we were back on a fire base. How did it get bad? Just corro well, corrosion or? Yeah, okay. You're out in the jungle. You got water. I carried bandoliers across me. Right. You could get dirt in there. <clears throat> you have to take your magazines apart. You have to re-lubricate them because the springs would break. Uh, you, you, had, you had to do that. I'll give you an example of, and it's scary. I was um, we're walking up this road one time, Ranger File, and these three groups were just walking to my left, and I I said, oh my God, my God, they just stopped and they're staring at us. So I told my two buddies either side to confirm that they're there. I said, so we then we set up and then we just peeled on them and ripped them. So I'm down and I went through one, I hit the magazine, dropped it, dropped the next one in, boom. After about three or four rounds, it stopped. Oh. Took it out, rejected that. Uh, by the way, I, I didn't mention this, I was very fortunate at an M16A1 which had the forward assist, and if anybody's familiar with weaponry, the A1 had a forward assist to make sure that that round was locked in. It was a bad, uh, it was a, a defective feature on the standard M16. So I, I made sure that was back in there, and I continued the battle. And then our sergeant at the time said we had to do some fire and movement. We had a big debate about that, because uh, we weren't, you know, we mean, we're not doing fire and movement. We are told we're in training not to do that. He ordered us to do it, we had to do that. 33 groups up. I went back and looked in the ground for that round. And it fired in the firing pin, it didn't fire. Now here I am, Bafuenka. <laughs> I want that first round to work. <coughs> and it didn't. 
Hmm. You know, I said, I, that, that scared the hell out of me. Yeah. Second question. Sorry. Second question. Um, did you have any inkling as to what the big picture was, what was going on, or were you just kind of like a mushroom, kept in the dark and all that? Uh, yeah, we, you, know, yeah. You know, we were told we were following orders to do what we had to do. It was pretty obvious when we got there that uh, we were fighting a civil war. And fortunately for me, uh, we fought the NVA. We didn't fight the, the Viet Cong. So the NBA really didn't put a lot of booby traps out there. They just, they, they kind of fought you one-on-one, -on -one. okay? Whereas the Viet Cong were more sneaky type of uh, uh, warfare. Mm -hmm. Sir. Yeah, question. You were in a jungle, jungle environment. How about snakes? That's the first thing that comes to my mind. Yeah, we had snakes, but we didn't. There was so much noise and battle going on. There weren't any animals. There weren't any birds. There, I think I saw one snake when I was there. And at one time we saw a monkey. And that was it. I mean, there weren't any birds. Because of all the battle. I mean, I was had experience that we were waiting to get resupplied. And we had to move to another position. And we had almost double time. But fortunately, we didn't have any equipment. We, we were on our sixth day and we didn't have anything left except the, you know, our weapons. And we had to double time up you know, away from this thing because they were going to bring in what they call a B-52 arc light strike. Well, we had to be two clicks away, two kilometers away, minimum distance. And when I sat down on this ridge and I heard this whoosh coming down and the noise and the ground shaking like an earthquake and then these big clouds of smoke coming mm -hmm. up because I was able to see this come in. I mean, you know, even the animals didn't want to be there. No. Sir. Yeah, I'm looking at this list. What did you guys each have a wheelbarrow or something? <laughs> no, it's a, we had a rucksack there. You, you, know? you had it, all this stuff. Uh, literally, yeah. literally, guys. I mean, when I was fully loaded, this is how I walked. <laughs> oh, wow. I had a I had to bend over because if I went like this, I fall backwards. <laughs> wow. how, how much did all this weigh? About 100 pounds. That's what I figured at least. The fully loaded 100 pounds, like 26 pounds of water. So you couldn't be very nimble running through the jungle, could you? What? No, but when you, well, here, first thing I did, okay, I had a, what they call a heavy load and a light load. And as soon as we got in battle, okay, it's something down, I, I would fall backwards because it was easy. Ah. I had two pins here, uh, and I would pull these two pins and I dropped my heavy load of butts out. I still had on me water, ammunition, oh. hand grenades. So I could go off and I can fight, with it. I can maneuver quite easily. Uh, mm. It's just one of those things, you know. You, you learn through experience. I mean, I, I, it's hard to say. You, they, there's so much training they can give you, but then you just, I'm actually doing it. Bob. Two questions. You call yourself a cavalry unit. Yes. You never mentioned it, a horse or a cow or anything? No, we had, mm -hmm. no ca cavalry horses were helicopters, Hueys. They're Huey helicopters, mm -hmm. and we used to put you know five or six of us in there, and uh, I mean, of course you had two door gunners and two pilots, mm -hmm. and um, How, uh, you had to be your own supply sergeant. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean you know you, you you know you had to manage your life out there. You know you just you know you had to make sure you got everything. I mean you know we we got to be supply. They they allocate the stuff up by teams, and you know we get all the stuff and. You know, whatever we pack it all away and get it all situated. You know, I, you know, it's like I could describe it. I mean, we just had to go down to the ammo <coughs> to get ammo. <laughs> How did the natives live? In the sense, that, you know, we talked about the discomfort for you guys, you know, white Americans. How did they survive? Well, the only okay, I was in a free fire zone. I mean, I could shoot anybody in front of me. I didn't, no questions asked. I didn't have to be shot at. Uh, so the only time anybody was in front of us that were civilians were bad guys. Mm. So uh, I, we never came across any villages or anything. I got to tell you, on that border of Vietnam, Cambodia, it's pretty much no man's land. Okay, except the only people out there were, you know, the good guys and the bad guys. I don't fancy your question. Or not. Yeah, I was just wondering, you know, about the heat and the bugs and all that kind of stuff. You know, that was people back, you know, you know, you know, back. Near Saigon and stuff, and the Delta. I mean, they survived whatever they did. You know, I, did, I wasn't really exposed to a lot of them. I mean, I, you know, I came in, I had three days of training, and I just they transported me out to Firebase St. Barbara. That was it. Get my introduction. Stu. Um, 
you use radio contact to radio back? You were the. Oh, we always had a radio guy. We always had a radio Did guy. You call in strikes. Uh, okay. What well, generally would happen is that uh, our team had we had uh, three guys. Excuse me, three to four guys. And first guy walked, and he was looking everywhere. Second guy looked in the trees and counted, because we all know how far we were going. And third guy looked on, on the perimeter. Then you had the squad leader, and then the, the RTO behind him. Okay, so we all had radios. The captain of the uh, unit um, would call in the airstrikes. So if we, as soon as we got hit, okay, I would say within four or five minutes, we had a helicopter gunship. Yeah, we can put stuff down, but that's why we need all the smoke grenades because we had a marker position. You know? right. They're looking down. They're looking at a you know canopy of trees. Right, right. You know, so they don't want you know. I tell you, I've seen what what, what a minigun can do to a human being. If you, if you don't know what a minigun is, it shoots bullets just like you take your hose and you squeeze it mm -hmm. on full, and you see all those droplets coming out. Mm -hmm. It shoots what it shoots bullets like that, and uh, mm -hmm. come across a, a a dead goop that was hit with a minigun. You see 70 or 80 uh, bullet holes in them. Mm, mm, so, mm, mm, mm. Sir. <clears throat> Two questions. First one, what's the rough uh, chain of logistics and supply? You had four or five guys that were taken by a helicopter out into do what you needed to do? hundred at a time. hundred what? The whole company went at a time. Oh, okay. And no then when, when you came back, that was an intermediate. <clears throat> how many steps before you got back to the, like Saigon, let's say? We never got back to Saigon. We stayed. We stayed right out there in the field. The only thing we went back to a fire base. The fire base was resupplied by that, some other logistics things, the big Chinook helicopters would bring supplies in and stuff. But uh, no, our, our, our group, you know, we had to, the, they moved us to the whatever territory they wanted to be in. When it was our turn to go back to the fire base, they'd bring in about, you know, well, it depends. If they had a landing zone, one time we had to get pulled out one helicopter at a time. We had to blow an LZ in the middle of the jungle to get back. It took us all day, you know, and uh, so I don't know if I'm answering yeah. your question. No, that's fine. A second quick question. There's been a, a bunch of uh, Vietnam War movies. I, I haven't really seen hardly any of them. I don't know if you have any comments on good, bad, or indifferent. You know, the Saving Private Ryan and the Normandy Beach scene is supposed to be very realistic and all these I, other... I thought, I thought uh, Saving Private Ryan was pretty realistic. Because um, they were shooting prisoners, so they said that. But um, on the Vietnam ones, I'm going to say pass. I mean, whatever ones I saw. Just yeah. Hollywood stuff? It's Hollywood stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, yeah, Joe. The reason why I say it's Hollywood stuff, because the act, you know, this is what I liked about Saving Private Ryan, was more realistic because the guys were dirty. Okay, you go to you watch yeah. the other movies, and the guys are all clean shaven. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not a soldier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, what was your overall mission? Was it protect the border or to. No, it was to go to find people and kill them. Just find. Just find uh, search yeah. and destroy. Search and destroy. Okay, you know, search and destroy. If you, were, if, if you were in front of us, we can kill you. Okay, and, and the other thing is uh, Agent Orange. Yeah. Was, that, was that used in the jungle where you were? Yes. Okay, what the, the Agent Orange, the Agent Orange was used to, to uh, defoliate, and, and what they originally defoliated was a hundred meter uh, perimeter, hundred meters out, around the whole fire base, so we have a field of fire. Hmm. So, you know, we would be walking through that stuff, they would, you know, they would spray it right there while we're going, you know, you know, oh, you know, can you get in the bunker while we're doing this? And, you know, Wow. So anyway, um, you know, it was very greasy and stuff. So, but what, what also what, about the Agent Orange is that they defoliated so much stuff it leached into the ground. Right. They gave us potable water. Mm -hmm. That means they drill, they drill, dug a well and they gave us that well water. Oh, gee. Well, mm -hmm. so one thing, you know, my, I have Agent Orange. I have chronic lymphoma leukemia because of that. I was diagnosed in 2010. I'm, I'm in remission right now got the uh, prostate cancer, and also what it did, it fried my sperm, so my, me and my wife could not have kids. Wow. So that was three things right there I could attribute to Agent Orange. Wow. Mm. You said it's a fire base, so this is a base you go back to? It's yeah, and there's, well, there's, gut, there's uh, uh, cans, and okay, so the fire base would, you know, we needed um, artillery support, 
you know, call back to the fire base and they'd send a 155 or 105 uh, based upon what a deferred observer we had in the company to drop shells in. But what they really did was they would fire the 175 millimeter guns out to some uh, forward observer in Cambodia someplace dropping shells in. So that was what the fire base was uh, designed was, was to do. Did you have barracks there? Oh, well, no, we no. had bunkers. Bunkers? Yeah, we had dirt walls and we had sandbag bunkers. So there was no <laughs> running, no, uh, no, 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 just, no, okay, you're using no. the trees. No, we had, you know, trenches for okay. you know, trains and all that stuff. Okay. It's, it was filthy. So basically, how long were you in? How long were you in? I was in the Vietnam only 90 days. 90 days. Okay. Yeah, That's I came home on a stretcher. I spent 150 days in a hospital recovering from my wounds. Uh, and here is a souvenir. Uh, this is the bullet I got shot with. I took my left thumb off and put a, a hole this big in my lung. I had about 20 minutes to live. Wow. And uh, this was in my lung for 62 days till they took it out of me in uh, Valley Forge Hospital. And uh, I happened to watch him. What's the show? Chicago PD? Or one of the cops on there? Olinsky or something. You know, he had said he, he's wearing a bullet like this. All right, he said he got shot with it. I said, Joyce, I've had this bullet for decades. So I went to the jeweler and got it made and wore it around my neck. You know? Wow. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. sir when yeah. you were going to Vietnam, you had the reality that you might have to shoot people. Yeah. How did you deal with that? That was easy. Uh, I was already a hunter. I mean, I killed deer. I had a small game. I grew up with guns. So uh, my, my job was to kill people. So the first one, from me to you, I laid in ambush. He was about 15 or 16 years old. I shot him 38 times. Mm, wow. Now, the hardest part was when they said awful clean up the battlefield. Yeah. That was a little tough when I had to pick him up and throw him away. Mm. <laughs> Ma'am. Um, I'm, no, I'm not sure if this makes sense because I'm trying very hard to make sense of everything in your abbreviations sometimes throw me off. But Bob uh, Fauché asked something about cavalry. And I, I, you are the Delta Company 2nd, 8th right. Cavalry, 1st Air Cavalry. Yeah. Now, does that mean that there were lots of additional groups like you uh, that were all called cavalry? Yeah, the 1st Air, first air Cavalry or, or it was uh, about 20... 20,000 men and women. Okay. Yeah. Uh, cavalry, uh, second and eight, I tell you, the first of the seven, that was Custard's old uh, unit that uh, was ambushed at the Little Bighorn. Hmm. That was the cavalry, the first cavalry <coughs> then. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, it evolved into what okay. it was when I was there. So when Bob said, well, it didn't mean horses, but did it always mean, or like you, you responded to him by saying it meant that the helicopters. Right, delivered. we weren't we weren't riding horses. We were riding helicopters. Right. And does that mean each of the ca anyone who was in Vietnam and the cavalry were they involved in that kind yes, of thing? Yes. Oh, that was way. That was yeah. We one of our relatives died of Agent Orange about maybe four years ago, and he had a cavalry address. Well, he probably had a big yellow meant. patch on his side like yes, I have. That was he was. He was in yeah. was the cavalry. Yes. Yeah. That was Wayne. Yeah. <coughs> Sir, <coughs> rules of engagement. Oh, oh. oh go ahead, sir. Oh. Did I hear you say men and women were in the cavalry? Well, there were men and women. I mean, we had nurses in the cavalry and stuff. I, I don't want to dis I don't want to disparage anybody and say there's only men in Vietnam. There were women there too serving. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good mm -hmm. And that's that's my political correctness too. <laughs> 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 sir, it's curious. Uh, why 38 times and not just 10? Got to make sure they're dead. Uh, that's why. That's yeah. right. You, you know, you, you want to think just come out. A lot come out of one shot time, right? Like two magazines that pumped in. We only kept 19 rounds in the magazine because they were jammed with 20. So it's automatic. Automatic. It's automatic. Oh yeah, I pulled it twice. Yeah, I just you know three and a half seconds dropped the thing. One second. Within right. 10 seconds, I hit 38 rounds in them. That's okay. He was still on his knees. He didn't even fall over yet. Wow. Sir, mm -hmm. the rules of engagement issue sounds like you guys could do what you needed to do and that was that. Yeah. And I remember with the first Iraq war, uh, I think Norman Schwarzkopf, some the, some reporter asked him, well, you know, what's your job and all this thing? And Schwarzkopf says, well, the army, we're supposed to break things and kill people. 
you know, and, and then it works into, well, we're going to build schoolhouses and you can only shoot after you've been shot at. I mean, any comment on how it, it got so bad or uh, the... Well, we didn't have any news people with us. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have anybody who was an anti-war zealot that's saying, oh, you should let them shoot at you first or something, you know? Yeah. So, <clears throat> you have to, no, today, in modern days, you got real-time real -time, uh, exposure. So, you know, someone says, well, you know, you know, well, they raised their hands up. Well, so what? You know, they could went, you know, reach back here for, you know, yeah, or something. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, done. You mentioned that you got a, a medal for saving someone. Are you willing to share that? Yeah, we had, um, we're walking through the jungle, and um, our left flanking movement happened to be exposed. It was a bunch of bomb craters, excuse me, bomb craters. And, and there was also these big anthills, and the anthills are about six or seven feet high. And this round and wow. Yeah. Wow. And so, oh, the left, uh, it's a flanking movement. And my, my buddy Matt uh, Alexander from um, Chicago, he was in front of me. I was walking second. And Matt says, oh, we, we, they're, we're running at each other. They should have been behind us a little bit because we walked in a, in, a, in, a, in a formation where the lead would be out there in front and the two flanking movements would be back a little bit as, as we walked through the jungle. Next thing you know, all hell broke loose. The whole uh, uh, wood line opened up, and nothing but white tracers coming at everybody. The point guy in the left flanking movement had a round go in between his helmet and his helmet liner, go up to it around and out the back. Saved his life. Wow. Matt yelling at me, because I hit the ground, and um, everybody else did. He was exposed out there on this area. I popped up, I went right by the anthill next to me, and I squeezed off about four magazines into the wood line and suppressed the fire. So they gave me a fight, gave me a medal for saving his life. That's nice. Yeah. How were you treated when you got back after you recovered? I, I, I didn't have really a problem. If someone gave me a hard time, you know, they usually ended up on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> when I went to school at Penn State, the dean just don't to leave the veterans alone, don't do anything because, you know, these guys are a lot of them are seasoned killers, you know, they don't hope yeah. they'll be screwed with, so it worked out okay. I, mean, I had a lot of respect, though, from, from the people I worked with and everything, so it really wasn't, um, it really wasn't that bad. Like I said, there's only a couple of people end up on the ground. Okay. Was, was this a one month or a one day or one year? How, how long was it? Oh, well, yeah, one a one-year tour. One year? Yeah, you had to be there for a year, you know. Um, I didn't make it here. I made 90 days. And they're, but, uh, they're wounded, right? uh, one of the things I'm going to do here, I have, I have handouts. And um, here is a photo from this historian. Watch, 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 watch the wire. Yeah. This one is historian. And this is about six pages. A lot of good information that uh, you could take this to just break it up in hand. Yeah. I got 15 here, so, you know, just. You have to share, share. And, yeah, See, I'll take and, I'll take and um, in there has a lot of information I shared with you. Uh, I vetted this historian, legitimate and everything. I never really documented anything about what I did. And I, was, I spent about five or six days putting this together and answer back to him. And the only thing I would ask you to do is to keep share. it. Yeah, Please just don't put it on any social media or anything like no. that. Oh, you got one, Dan? I've got one. Okay. And, um, but in there, mm -hmm. there's some things, okay? One of the things is uh, you know, my day-to-day -day experience, yeah. which I elaborate a lot more what I go oh, through. Oh, she's got one. She's got one, okay. On a typical day, yes, just like it. getting up uh, in the morning, preparing some food, going through some of uh, the your biological things you got to do, making sure I get my malaria pill, all, this, all these different kind of things. Also in there, I described when I got hit and what I went through. And um, one you. of the highlights is that I had about 20 minutes to live, and uh, that was the least of my problems. I was in the worst firefight in my life. I mean, I could see from about 8 to 10 feet away the, the muzzle flashes coming out of the, the bunkers that the gooks were in, because mm -hmm. we went into this bunker complex. And going down there, we had the, the, the CO come down, and we had stopped. We were at the lead point. And we refused to walk down the trail. So we don't walk down trails, we're going to get ambushed. Captain came down, threatened us with Article 15s. I'm sure any of you 
guys know what Article 15s are that we're in the service. And for those of you who don't, it's like getting a DUI, okay, against your driver's license. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had this big debate, and he says, I'm going to give you Article 15, so if you don't walk down the trail, and walk 100 meters, and we're setting up wherever you are. Because it was nighttime, we had a, it takes us hours to set up at night. So we're about 50 meters, we get down that trail, and kaboom, set off the mine. That's where this shell came from, that hit me. Mm. And all hell broke loose. And I guess after about four magazines that I hit, I looked down and I'm squirting blood out of this lung. Mm. I lay back, you know, Joe's hit. Medic came up, you know, we had guys come up. I was very fortunate that I had great buddies. Uh, five other guys got wounded getting me out of there. So um, mm. they put me in a poncho, they drug me back to another, you know, bunker crater. And um, I hear the CEO, you know, the, the bird's coming in. He says, you know, I get a guy who's got maybe 10 minutes. Mm. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm holding on and bringing on one lung. And uh, my, my squad leader come up, asked me, can, 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 can he have my gun? I said, yeah, because I had that brand new M16A1. No one had, else had one. And um, they're all checking me out and stuff, and the medic's working on me. He got wounded, getting me slid back. And, mm. and I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to get out of here? Mm. We're in a major battle, gunship shooting. The gooks got a 51 caliber anti-aircraft gun shooting at their gunships. And we know where this bird's gonna land here. He's looking at hard reader to look me up. So I thought, what the hell, you know, I'm screwed. So my ride's coming in, next thing you know, this harness comes on, bailing down from the ground. It's about eight feet long. Guys pick me up, strap me up into this harness. What's going on? You'll see. We went around, the cable came down, hooked me up, and James bonded me right out of there. Wow. Wow. Bouncing off trees. Wow. 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 Five minutes later, <laughs> I was on a mash unit. Wow. 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 Oh wow. Another question. Uh, your immediate group of people, or maybe the, the second largest group you were in, consistent, or did you have a lot of replacements come in? and? Um, I replaced the guy that got wounded, okay, and, um, you know, it's pretty much, a, I think we had like 96 guys in the company in three platoons, hmm. and uh, hmm. yeah, when I was there, it was, it was pretty much static, you know, I don't remember anybody floating. I didn't know anybody else in the other two platoons, I really wasn't there. Well, I didn't, we didn't socialize a lot, hmm. okay, hmm. you were pretty much with your little group of guys, four or five guys in your platoon overall, but... You know, you kind of lived together with these other four or five guys, and uh, you, know, you spent your whole life there with them. You know, you, 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 you're, you were, you're a team working as together as a team, and you, you know, you slept in the same spot night at night and everything else like that. You pulled guard duty together and everything else like that. So, it's the best I could say, a little tiny family. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. What about what about that captain? Did he uh, apologize for ordering you guys down the trailer? <laughs> I don't know. You know, you know, he probably got his ass chewed out by the sergeants. I know that. You know, yeah. they told you uh, what's going to happen, and that's what happened. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It's so, terrible, um, terrible decision. Yeah, yeah. really. But um, yeah, like I said, yeah, it, was, it was interesting. We're named Angry Skipper because I did a little research and did that. Apparently, my company, Delta Company, was the bad, the baddest company in the, the battalion, and that's how I got the uh, that the name of Angry Skipper. Hmm. So. Hmm. Uh, out there, there are some pictures of, of, of back then that uh, some of the guys posted. Hmm. I tried contacting some of the people that I thought I might be able to, based upon the window of time they were there, but I sent them email, but I don't know if they were still alive or not. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when you're in combat and you're faced with uh, dire circumstances, you justify the circumstances for the cause you're fighting for. Did you guys have a cause? Did, did you know what the hell you were fighting for? No. And I'll tell you right now, the cause was to stay alive. I mean, seriously, it was to stay alive. What did they do to your thumb? Huh? What did they do to your thumb? You shot. It was shot up. Oh, who was still attached? Yeah, it was just, yeah, they put it all back together and it works wow. fine. Wow. Yeah. 
Wow, wow, amazing. Amazing, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, Hawkeye and Vision are pretty much the same character. Yeah, I thought, originally, I thought that was the only woman I had. I said, well, that's no big deal, you know. But then all of a sudden, I feel a little lightheaded, and then I'm bleeding like a... Wow. From the MASH unit, did you go to Germany then? No. Or they didn't have it then? Oh, no. MASH unit, I went back there near Saigon. I went to Quan Loy, I think. And then... Uh, and how long before you were back stateside? Oh, God. I didn't get back till the end of September. Okay. Uh, and that's why I found out I had the slug in me. No one ever told me I had the slug in me. Uh, wow. You know? Huh. So, yeah, but then, you know, then, like 150 days I spent in the hospital. Wow. Yeah, you were saying that, all right, you, you were in the hospital and you noticed you had a problem with your thumb, and then you noticed you had a hole. In, you didn't feel pain when you were in shock or what? With the, with the hole in your chest? No, I didn't. No, no, I didn't. No, I didn't feel pain? No, not till later. Yeah, I was, yeah, I, I was focused on what I needed to do. I just yeah. breathed, breathing on one lung and cooperating well, with you the Oh, you were breathing on one lung? Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. wow. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go into shock or, you know. But you didn't out. feel any pain? They wow. gave me a couple of ones. I mean, I, I, I wasn't thinking about pain. You know, I hate to say that, but I wasn't thinking about pain. I was well, thinking I about... I was just wondering if it was strictly medic, mental termination of pain. Yeah, yeah. I, by the way, yeah, I, something yeah, like that, it. but I really didn't have any really uh, pain. I was just focused on doing what I had to do to just stay alive. I mean, I, I can't explain it anyway. You know, you know pain can be considered a relative thing. You can block it out, or you can right, right. create it in your own body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. sir. How did you save that person's life again? I heard part of it. Was that? You saved that person's life? But it, uh, How did you do it again? I heard part but, of it. Well, well um, he, was, he was in a kill zone, right, right. and I came up, and uh, everyone else's head's down, and I was the only one behind the anthill shooting. And I pumped in four magazines into the wood line, and, the firing stopped, and I, because we got the flow of fire, we stopped the, their flow of fire, and then got our flow of fire going. That's mm -hmm. one of the things about what you do is if you get ambushed like that, you got to get the flow of fire going your way. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. having everybody's head down and not returning any fire is not a good thing. No. So. Mm -hmm. Can you describe a claymore mine? Because I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just give me a chance here. You gonna build one for us? Uh, <laughs> I'd like to. <laughs> it looks about this big. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's got about uh, I think it's four pounds of C4 in it, and 700 ball bearings. Oh, wow. And uh, believe me, it is really lethal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a 180 degree kill path out to about uh, 50 meters, depending on you know how open mm -hmm. the space is. Wow. And uh, it, it, it does the job. <coughs> well, how do you get to aim properly? Because you said it goes out. The shape. Well, you, well, you just it aim it, put it in front of you. Okay, oh, you're some... holding on to this? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> you put out a tree with a tree. No. <laughs> well, yeah. it, has a, it has a couple little stands, okay? You stand it up, and it has on one side, this side to enemy. <laughs> <You're sorry about laughs> <laughs> and then, then what you have is you have 75 feet of, of wire with a detonator yeah. and a, a blasting cap on the other end. You put that inside it, and then you go back 75 feet. Okay, and so, and then what you when you do with that when you hit the thing, you duck. That's what the hole's for. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow. Sir. All right. The second page it says, "What was the funniest incident that ever happened to you while you were in service?" Nothing ever happened was funny. I'll tell you. Yeah, but now nothing, you can laugh. Yeah, well, yeah, but nothing ever was funny. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was very good. Very good. Very good. Thank you.